Have you ever watched a TV show called Alone? The premise of it is that they take people and they drop them off in wilderness areas. I mean, like way northern Vancouver Island or Patagonia, I mean, just out in the wilderness, and they leave them alone. And the person who can survive the longest typically wins five hundred to hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars. But they get like ten pieces of survival equipment, you know, a shovel, an axe, that type of thing that they get to choose. And then basically they just get dropped off. And they have to make shelter, they have to find food, they have to do everything. And they generally do this in the late fall so that they have the sense that winter is coming. And it's a pretty amazing program as the weeks uh, go by to see what they build, but also what happens to them personally. Most everybody loses a tremendous amount of weight and it, affect, it affects them in different ways. Uh, one contestant in particular uh, had lost so much weight that I think they go bi-weekly or something with the doctors and check him out. And they finally had to pull him because his health had become absolutely critically in danger. Th the amazing thing though is that this guy who had just basically become skin and bones, when they went inside the little hut that he had built for himself, it was absolutely packed with dried fish. I mean, there was more fish there than he could have eaten in the rest of the competition. But somehow, he wasn't able to live into the reality that he had enough food, and so he wouldn't eat it, and he just starved himself. There was, there was a reality that would have kept him healthy, and he couldn't live into it. Defining reality is one of the most important things that we can do. And Jesus comes back to this a lot, what the reality of the situation is, particularly when he's talking about the kingdom of God coming and the new reality that that brings into our world. And so we're going to look at that idea this morning, the reality of the kingdom of God and what it looks like uh, for us. And so we're going to do it in a portion of the Sermon on the Mount, a couple of verses that come out of Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, context, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. It's very near Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and it pretty much encapsulates what Jesus believes the kingdom of God looks like. And it comes immediately after the Beatitudes, where Jesus really lays out the countercultural um, values of the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who, who mourn. Blessed are the meek. And he goes on and on and on. And what this is about is Jesus saying that living into the reality of the kingdom of God brings blessing. And oddly, it also brings happiness. Because one of the perfectly good translations of the words of Jesus in the Beatitudes is happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are the meek. And I said, oddly, it brings happiness because the things that Jesus espouses in the Beatitudes and in the Sermon on the Mount don't really sound like anything that would bring happiness. It's kind of hard to accept Jesus's reality. We usually have another reality that goes, happy are the rich, happy are the powerful, happy are the winners. And so immediately, we got to kind of ask ourselves this question. Which reality are we living into? Where the winners are happy or the meek are happy? Into kingdom reality or into the reality that we see around us all the time? Or another way of looking at it is, is Jesus right or is Jesus wrong? And I think we also have to acknowledge that there's a difference between the gospel in the abstract and the gospel in the concrete. It's one thing to say we believe something, it's entirely another to actually live as if our beliefs were real. 
And so in this passage, Jesus says, here's what concrete gospel living looks like. You are salt and light, therefore be those things. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. There, there's a, a fun little Greek emphasis in the word there. It really means you yourself are the salt of the earth. You yourself are the light of the world. And let's unpack that for just a second, because usually, particularly with light, we think of Jesus as being the light of the world. And in two weeks when Advent begins, we'll be talking about Jesus being the light of the world a lot. And Jesus is the light of the world, but we carry that light. You carry that light. And as has often been said, you're the only Jesus that people are going to see. It's like Jesus is saying, I've provided the light and now you need to reflect it to others. I've provided the light and now you need to take that light and bring it to others because if you don't bring the light into your life situation and context, all those people are just gonna keep wandering around in the darkness. Now light is relatively easy to understand. Light helps us see. We shine the light of the gospel to help people not to catch people doing something wrong or to show the sordid underbelly of life. We shine light to help show people the way to finding real hope and tangible peace and a deep joy. We shine light so that people can find what we've found in Jesus. And it's kind of the same thing with salt, only salt's a more difficult metaphor. We need to talk more about that. First of all, what does salt do? Well, it does lots of things. Uh, salt is a preservative, it disinfects things, it, it adds flavor, and it's kind of, and more, but it's kind of hard to nail down which of those meanings Jesus is really getting at unless he means all of them, and he might. So I wanna talk though about two separate properties of salt that seem to make the most sense, at least to me in this context. The first is that salt is a preservative. Pre-refrigeration, salt keeps food from decaying. Have you ever not emptied the kitchen trash can when you should have? And you come home from work or school and you walk into the house and you're like, oh my gosh, what in the world is that? And you realize that whatever you tossed in the trash a couple of days ago has kind of developed a new life on its own because it started to rot and now it stinks to high heaven. That would have happened to everything pre-refrigeration, and salt would prevent that. It prevents it from spoiling, it prevents it from decaying. And so when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, what he's saying is, your presence among the people that you hang out with keeps them from decaying. You have an opportunity to preserve life. That's what salt does. You ward off the stench of death. In fact, you ward off death as the salt of the earth. And I wanna be a little bit careful about how we talk about decay because it may or not be social issues. That would certainly be easy. We could come up with a list and say, people who do those things are evidence of social decay or the fact that our nation now tolerates these things is evidence of social decay. But Paul writes in Romans chapter three, none of us is righteous, not one. It's not so much the decay in the society that's the problem, the decay is in our hearts. How many of us were opposed to something until it affected us or someone we love? And then we found cause to reevaluate our beliefs and our behavior. Sometimes we cut ourselves slack that we refused to cut other people. The decay is in our hearts. Our behavior is just the symptom, or it just shows what's really in our hearts. So as you think about the people that you come across on a regular basis, are you helping people's hearts be preserved, or are you helping people's hearts decay? The second thing about salt, after the fact that it preserves things from decay, is that it's necessary for life. Now, I'm not a medical person, but salt helps our bodies balance fluids. 
And we need salt for any number of things. Without salt, you'd die. So it's a bit of a shade of a different meaning on the preservative aspect of it. I think what Jesus is saying is that the church, all of us together, is necessary for life to continue. The influence of the church preserves the world. If the church doesn't preserve the world, the world can't live. And I think that's rather profound, especially if you back up over the last 2,000 years and you remember that almost every single hospital, almost every single educational institution, almost every single social welfare program got its start in the church. The church has a tendency to preserve life at its best. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. And that's rather profound, I think. We preserve and we bring life, unless we don't. And sometimes I wonder if the church has lost its way. Jesus addresses this when he talks about salt losing its saltiness. Well, how does salt lose its saltiness? Well, for all intents and purposes, it can't. So what is Jesus getting at here? So let's look at context again. If you were to live where Jesus lived, where do you get salt from? Uh, okay, you go to the grocery store. Yeah. Where does, where, where does that come from, though? More than likely, it came from the Dead Sea, where water evaporates, and or they push water out in these large pans, and they let it all dry out, and you get salt and gypsum. Salt is, wait for it, salty. Gypsum isn't. The problem is, gypsum looks a lot like salt. And so what a lot of people think that Jesus is referring here to is not that salt that has lost its saltiness, but gypsum that people thought was salt, but it didn't turn out to be salt at all. Salt doesn't lose its saltiness. It wasn't salt in the first place. It was probably gypsum. It looked like salt, it felt like salt, but it wasn't salt. Do you see where Jesus might be going here? Do you see where I'm going here? And I think we're seeing this at a really accelerated pace in American culture right now. And one of my favorite writers and bloggers, Kerry Newhoff, uh, talks about this a lot with people returning or not returning back to church and their faith communities. A significant number of people across the country just aren't coming back. And here at Car Harbor Covenant, we've noticed a lot of people that aren't coming back. And I'm not talking about people that are joining us online. I'm talking about people who just will not be back one way or another. It has sort of accelerated the decline of attendance among people who weren't really committed. Maybe they weren't really salt in the first place. It seems a little harsh, but this is the direction that Jesus is going with. And it's lamentable. We miss people, but it's kind of okay, too, because lots of people are returning. Lots of people have returned. Lots of people never left Lots of new people are coming, and the people who are coming are really committed. And as a church, during this whole wacky 18 to 20 months, we immediately doubled down on being salt and light within our community and to the community outside of our doors. And Jesus notes that if salt has lost its saltiness, it's only good for one thing, and that's to be thrown out. And this is the second time in two weeks that we've heard Jesus talk about throwing something out. Last week, it was the worthless servant who didn't uh, provide any return on investment for the kingdom. And this week, it's salt, which lost its saltiness, or was never really salt in the first place. It just kind of pretended it was salt. There's accountability for how we live our lives, particularly if we say that we're following Jesus. You either are or you aren't salt and light. You either are or you aren't committed. And this is a really good time to decide which one you are.
When Jesus was saying this, most scholars agree that it was first and foremost an indictment of religious people at the time. Jesus was saying, you are salt. You're supposed to keep everything from spoiling, from going bad. You're supposed to arrest the decay. But now you've joined the decay. You're supposed to be the light to show people where they're going. But now you've become part of the darkness. That's quite an indictment. They became that way by forgetting to live into the new reality of the kingdom of God and by being seduced by the lies of the culture. So there was nothing to distinguish them from people who were wandering in, around in the dark, slowly decaying. How does that happen for us today? I think we see evidence of it in some ways. I think in the level of anger, in hatefulness, Man, there are all sorts of things that could characterize the Christian community when it's not at its best, but hatefulness should never be one of those. By incivility and by confusing the gospel with partisanship. And I've been thinking about that a lot. And notice that I said partisanship, not politics. I think they're different. Early Christians were persecuted because they said there was no other Lord except Jesus. They weren't persecuted because they were backing another candidate for emperor. And I think there's an enormous difference. Certainly we have to be citizens of the country, but our primary allegiance has to be to Jesus. So it's intended originally to be a critique, but it also holds up the positive. So let's look at it that way. You are light, you are salt, you can make a difference by bringing Jesus into your world. There's this great quote that is often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. It's said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. It's a great quote, but St. Francis never said it. And neither did St. Augustine, which is surprising because St. Augustine said everything. And actually, I know a lot of people who really don't like the quote anyway, so it's just as well that St. Francis never said it because they think that we can use that as an excuse to never actually say anything at all. And it really points up the need that there are two things that need to go on as we live out the reality of our faith. We've got to walk the walk, but we also have to talk the talk. If we're only talking and there's no evidence that our lives have been changed or that we're living in the kingdom of God by our walk, then that doesn't matter. And if we only walk and do good things, but we never talk about why we do those things, well, that's not that helpful either. Something is still lacking. Sure, you're kind, but why? Yes, you've hung in with your marriage and you made it a success, but why? You're generous with your time and your money, but why? Your work ethic is different. Your integrity is high, but why? If you never actually tell people those things, they'll never know. Being salt and light is about walking the walk, but there's also a time to talk to talk. There's a time to share about why your life is different. There's a place to talk about Jesus and how he fits into your story. Now, some people have the gift of evangelism, and I stand in, stand in awe of these people. They can go to, I mean, I hear these stories. They can go to Home Depot, and sidle up next to somebody who's buying, you know, a doorknob, and eventually introduce them to Jesus. This is not my gift. And judging by most people, this is not most of our gifts. When we think of evangelism, a lot of us picture, you know, some obnoxious guy in a street corner with a bullhorn or carrying signs that are offensive. Others of us think about, you know, a guy who sits next to people on an airplane and thinks of them as a captive audience for four hours. But I think the scriptures have a really practical piece of advice about when to share our faith. It comes out of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter writes, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So I emphasize two words. Let me go back and read it the right way in English. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 
This isn't about imposing your belief system on people that don't want to know. This isn't about hijacking a social situation and making it awkward for everybody. This isn't about being a person who has a set thing that they say in every circumstance and doesn't see that they're making someone else uncomfortable. This is about answering questions that people ask. Now, so many of you would have ex examples of this, but I can't tell you how many times Megan and I have just been living our lives and somebody will ask us a question. I, I remember one of my neighbors stopping me in the middle of the street and saying, your marriage is different. You and Megan treat each other differently. Why do you do that? Now, if I had just walked the walk, I would have missed an enormous opportunity to say, well, let me tell you about our story. And that's where it comes in. He asked, I answered his question. And you don't answer with, well, let's kneel down right here and you can confess your sins and receive Jesus. You tell your story. Because for one reason, nobody can argue with your story. Uh, one of my favorite stories is Philip Yancey, who has written many, many books. Maybe you have read some of them. And he talked about pre-pandemic. Uh, he'd get on an airplane and, you know, he'd generally at least chat with a person who's there for a second. And eventually they'd find out that he was a Christian and that he wrote books. And he was like, invariably, they have some horror story about the church. And he said, I listen to their horror story. And then when they're done, I say, oh, it's worse than that. And I tell them one of my horror stories, and then they listen to what I have to say because he talks about why he still believes in Jesus. People ask a question, you answer the question, you tell your story. Being committed to Jesus is about living our lives in such a way that we acknowledge the reality of the kingdom of God that we live into, that we're salt, that we bring light to people, and then answering the questions that people ask. So let me ask you some questions this morning. The first is, how committed are you to this Jesus thing? Number two, how is that commitment evidenced in your life? And number three, what is one example of how you brought light into a dark situation recently?